we had to find a nice name for that because uh, otherwise, uh, you know, it's very difficult to decide what you consider a neighbor. A neighbor can be geographic, can be historic, can be a remote neighbor, can be an influential neighbor, could be an ex-influential neighbor. Bottom line, we called it Silk Road. And uh, this uh, type of meeting taking place in Kabul among the ambassadors of the Silk Road team includes obviously countries which uh, normally would not be considered exactly neighbors but have a lot of stakes or a lot of interest. So it goes from uh, India all the way to Turkey, passing through Russia, obviously the immediate neighbors, which I don't need to remind you about, including the stands. And um, they all have a stake, and they all are interested, and I think it's a genuine interest in stability in Afghanistan. But many of them have also communities which are very close to them, or can be influenced by them, or are influencing them. The Shia community vis-a-vis -vis Iran, the Pashtuns vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan, just to mention, with Turkmens, Uzbeks, and so on. Um, the secret there is to be able to make sure that this type of dialogue is maintained so that it doesn't become only a bilateral discussion. And that's what we have been doing and continue Now, how to make sure that the arguments are not just political? Because if you talk to them in a meeting, they will all say, we all agree about stability in Afghanistan. Then, in concrete, you need then to fine-tune what is your concern about uh, the future of Afghanistan. And they may tell you, for instance, drugs. A lot of drugs going to Iran, a lot of drugs going to Russia. Or they may tell you we may be concerned about uh, long-term American permanent basis, because it does give us a feeling of um, threat. Well, that helps all of us to fine-tune the messaging uh, that we give to everyone, that perhaps uh, uh, the way you present the future strategic agreement that is going to be taking place between uh, the United States and uh, the Afghanistan does take into account uh, the sensitivities of neighboring countries in terms of it. For instance, no base will ever be permanent. For instance, a base will never be used uh, a, against any neighbor. For instance, they will only be active uh, on call bases from the government and renewable by the government, and so on and so on. This type of discussion helps everyone, hopefully, to start feeling more comfortable about what could be the future scenario of a stable Afghanistan and making them feeling comfortable with it. Um, the other areas are economic. Think about uh, the railways, the roads, the water, the electricity, the grids, the, uh, and the minerals, access to ports. There was a very good uh, agreement which was actually sponsored very effectively by Richard Holbrook, which was between Pakistan and Afghanistan. But it took years to get that. But it made a big difference in the terms of interaction, which is not just words. Um, Iran, Iran is uh, a big country, I'm stating the obvious, with a long border with Afghanistan and with also a strategic concerns about what happens in Afghanistan. Um, they have a Shia community with whom they are uh, feeling uh, in touch. They have uh, a big problem about drugs and they don't like the Taliban because the Taliban themselves did affect them very badly when they were in charge in Afghanistan and even killed, uh, I think, about nine to ten of their own diplomats in mazar sharif So uh, the, ignoring Iran would be a big mistake. Engaging it constructively is the only way, but it's not only Iran. Pakistan is, if not even more important in terms of constructive engagement. So it's a lot of work on that, but I don't see this as a back uh, showstopper at all, because they all are worried, all of them, about a Afghanistan that returns to chaos, and none of them, none of them, wants Afghanistan to go back in the hands of the Taliban. The Pakistanis are suffering enormously. In fact, they've been suffering more than Afghanistan from their own Taliban these days. So, 
long answer to a very good and short question. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Sean Tandon. I'm a journalist with the AFP News Agency. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what you said at the beginning about the surge strategy, how you assess that as being working. Certainly from an outside perspective, you look at the violence in the south, you look at the situation in Kandahar, the delay in, in any sort of large military operation in that area, and it's, it's hard to see, at least from the outside, it's hard to see results there. In what sense do you think that the surge is working? And you're talking more about the diplomatic track, perhaps, than the military track? Um, it's... I know that one could look at it from so many points of view, so you have to just accept the fact that I'm looking at it from one angle. The angle I'm trying to see it is the following. The, um, when you have a, a substantial search taking place in the South, uh, you detect and you understand also that uh, often the Taliban are tempted to destabilize other areas in order to send a signal that uh, this is uh, not enough in order to make the so-called momentum reverse. But when you look at carefully, you start seeing that they are doing spectacular attacks uh, or attempting to do spectacular attacks in places where you don't expect it. We have been monitoring them very carefully, of course, in Kabul, in Herat, in Mazari Sharif, in Jalalabad, not so much in Kandahar. And by doing so, they are making also substantial mistakes. Remember Afghan Iraq? I was there. And when Mr. Zarqawi started doing horrific attacks in the middle of a square on a Friday in the market of the fruits and birds and killing 80 people, we have seen since the surge has started to become incrementally active, we have seen more and more of this taking place. Jalalabad. 24 people killed in a bank and 32 wounded by a person shooting in front of a video camera in the bank. And you had it in the Buskashi, which is the national game of the Afghans. And they respected by them as much as we do with football or baseball. You had it at close to a school. You had it at the ID card place. And most of them, actually all of them, civilians. Okay. These are mistakes produced by the feeling that there is a need to produce a counter-narrative to the, uh, the reversal of the momentum. And that's why if you look at it from an incident point of view, it looks very bad. But when you look at it on the operational point of view, these are explosions trying to change the narrative but not changing the holding or the grip on them. Second is that uh, you can see from the Afghans that there are uh, the feeling that um, the hold by the Taliban on territory, territory areas is not there anymore. Of course, they may return. That's why spring is going to be crucial. But they may not find the armed catches. They may not find the cave where they actually were putting their own weapons or they were hiding during a period. So the end of uh, this, in terms of judgment, will be one, when the surge would have exhausted its own peak, June. Second, when the spring would have shown whether the Taliban have been able to do a counteroffensive or not, and therefore the security would have been changing in terms, particularly about perception.